Jones at the University of Bath. Um, he'll be presenting his team's work on, um, and others, I guess, uh, on chemical recycling using zinc and magnesium catalysts um, for polyesters. So uh, tackling very similar challenging plastics as we just as I just talked about, but using um, homogeneous um, uh, inorganic catalysts. Hopefully you can see the slides okay. Excellent. Cheers, Bruce. Well, first of all, thank you, Bruce, for that incredibly interesting talk. I, I have read a lot about the um, enzyme way of degrading polymers, and I've never really properly understood it till then. So it's been an, an, an enlightening um, 30 minutes for me there. So this this seems like a really interesting um, set of talks from the Catalysis Hub here, and, it, and it's interesting to get a cross section of, of various types. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing here in Bath on catalytic upgrading of polymers. And I'm going to try and answer the question, is chemical recycling the answer? But he says he's going to try and answer the question, but I will give you the answer first. I think the answer that I want to get to is in part. It is part of the solution and, and hopefully we'll, we'll come to that in a bit. So what I'll do is I'll give you a brief sort of overview about plastic recycling challenges and opportunities, and then I'll discuss some of the catalytic systems that we work, that we are working on. So I think I, 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 don't, I won't dwell too much on this, but the vast majority of plastics we're used to are, are polypropylene and polyethylene, and they're mostly derived from, from um, unsustainable resources, and these equate for approximately 6% of the worldwide gas usage. The USA has about a billion poly, poly, polyethylene bags, and then they're not as good as, as the UK for, for, for recycling. And there's loads of statistics that we could talk about, and, and I'm sure others have got them in, in your PhD thesis, etc., about um, plastic recycling. But I think the important point here is that we, I think we're at kind of at a watershed moment for, for the industry, where we could um, we could actually start viewing plastics as a resource for sort of chemical mod modification. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of excellent work in this area. So you will have seen on, on some of your, I think it's on the, um, on the sweeps or Coke bottles, there's this plant bottle trademark. And so that's where they're using 30% of the PET is bio-derived from, from the ethylene glycol. And also the UK, um, the coalition government a few years ago banned the use of plastic bags or they it introduced a levy, sorry, about 5p on, on plastic bags. And this has had a humongous um, change in, in public behaviour. So I think it actually is an exciting time to be working on catalysis. And I think it's also an exciting time to be working on catalysis for, for polymers and for polymer um, recycling. So we do a lot of work at Bath on, on renewable polymers, biodegradable polymers. Now, I think we have to be really careful when we use the term biodegradable in exactly what we mean. So if you were to ask um, the general public what biodegradable means, I think they would say that it would, it would obviously degrade over time. But I think for some some biodegradable plastics, they are they are biodegradable, but under only certain certain conditions. So I think we have to actually be very careful when we use the term biodegradable, just to make sure that we're not kind of misleading and um, de and deceiving people. And so I think there is a huge opportunity in in this in this area. So if you've not read or seen this paper here in Scientific um, Advances of about five years ago, I would highly recommend that you download that this evening for a bit of bedtime reading. And I think this really does highlight the, the problem with plastics, okay? So overall, there's been 8,000, approximately 8,300 million metric tons of plastic produced. Some is still in use. Some has been discarded in landfill and in the ocean. And I think um, in, in the ocean, I think enzymes have got a humongous part to play in trying to degrade some of those materials. Some has been insinuated and a small amount of the plastic has been recycled. I think it's also important just to highlight that, that plastics aren't really the enemy. It is kind of us and what we choose to do with them 
that's the problem. Because if you think about it, so plastics, they're light, they're durable, and they're flexible. So they serve a tremendous um, important processes, our computers, cope, well, everything is made out of plastics. But what we really now need to start to consider is their end of life options. How can we actually make incentivize and how can we actually utilize these to a much more greater extent after they've done what they need to do? So it is so we have to, so they are, I think it is fair to say they are an environmental success, which is now turning in to an environmental problem. They were an environmental success and catalysis was at the heart of that with, with the Ziegler Natter in, in the 1940s and the 1950s, and then with stereoselective polyolefin production, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to do now is use clever catalysis to actually help solve the problem that we are causing with plastics. And so this is this is the traditional model for actually utilizing this. I can see that the PhD student who actually generated some of these figures is in the audience today. So hopefully he won't ask any tough questions at the end. So we extract our resource, we then consume and we throw it away. So the, the linear model is make, use and dispose. And what we need to do is sort of move away from that model of the make, use and dispose model. And this is where the so-called, this is where um, <clears throat> the so-called um, circular economy has come in. So we still extract, we produce, we use, and instead of throwing it away, we can then sort of recycle it. And then we can recycle it back to the monomers. And then we can go through this cycle over and over again. What we can also do with chemical recycling is instead of going back to the monomer, it's also possible to actually convert, convert the plastic into other sort of higher value chemicals. And this potentially could add to, um, add to the economics um, of the process for doing this. I think I, I, I often wonder about whether it, it obviously we have to stop using single um, single use plastics, but I think there will always be opportunity, there will always be needs for them. So, for example, if you have a medical device, we all used loads of single use plastic um, in, in the recent COVID pandemic. And so I think there are there will be times where we still will need to, to keep single-use plastics for, for medical device. And what we need to try to do is to keep the carbon in the highest value form. So sort of just burning it isn't keeping the carbon in the highest value form, but converting it back into its monomer or into higher value chemicals is what we need to do. Now, this is a slide that I sort of show not in, in part in, in a final year polymer chemistry course that I used to teach here, in, here at Bath. So polymerization is an equilibrium. So if you have your, your monomers, you can obviously convert that to your, to your polymer. If you are below the ceiling temperature, then if you're below the ceiling temperature, if you've got monomers, they will polymerize to form polymers. But if your temperature is above the ceiling temperature, then it is then possible to convert your equilibrium and you can go the other way and you can form, um, you can depolymerize. So I think it's important that I, I will just make a slight um, definition. So depolymerization is where you go back to the monomer. Some of the results I'll talk about aren't truly depolymerizations, they are degradations. So in the work that we're doing, um, which, which I'll show in a few slides time, we don't always go back to the polymer, but I, people tend to use depolymerization and degradation or in, 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 in lieu of each other, but, but really depolymerization means you go back to the monomer. And what you can do is you could upcycle your, um, polymer as well, and you can sort of convert this in, into higher value um, commodity chemicals as well. And theoretically, it is this sort of um, the thermodynamics and equilibrium is, is present in all polymer, polymerizations, but in reality, it, it, in reality, it, it isn't. Sometimes when you heat it up past the ceiling temperature, it decomposes rather than, rather than going back into the monomer. And, and it's in, it, I think it's really important to, to look at 
the, the plastic and the polymer that we're that, that we're interested in. And I don't think a one size fits all process is actually quite the way to go. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and I just I'm going to talk a lot about um, chemical recycling. But at the moment, all plastic or the, any plastic, the majority of plastic that is recycled goes through um, something called mechanic, a mechanical recycling process. So be, I just want to be very, very clear. I am absolutely not dissing mechanical recycling. Mechanical recycling is an essential part of the circular economy and it is an established technology. And this is the current way that say, we, if you buy anything that says the, the, the plastic is recycled, it will have been done via a mechanical recycling process. So I, I just want to be crystal still clear that I am not dissing mechanical recycling in any shape or form. What I am saying is that chemical recycling is a complementary technology. It's not a competitive technology. technology. It is complementary to mechanical recycling. So mechanical recycling does have some problems. It can be limited to uh, only being able, the plastic cannot be, re can be recycled maybe, I don't know, four, four or five times is what's sometimes written, and it may lead to downcycling. So you might, you might not always get back the polymer with the same properties as you started with, okay? And so that's the problem with mechanical recycling. And that's due in part due to the fact that you can't always get a pure feed. So chemical recycling, what is theoretically possible to do is to convert the, the plastic back into the monomer and then you can go through a loop and you can make the plastic with exactly the same properties again. Now, it was interesting that, that Bruce also mentioned this um, in, in, in a bit more detail than I will, but we have to be very careful with the sorting and washing of the plastics. There will be additives in the majority of plastics, fillers and pigments and plasticizers, silica, et cetera, et cetera. And so in chemical recycling, we do have to be a little bit more careful about these because these could in, in poison the catalyst in some way. And I think there's a lot to be said for trying to design simpler sort of materials that are made of one or two plastics rather than potentially being made of four or five. I started work in this area looking at um, PLA, polylactic acid, and this is a polymer very close to my heart. So this is my favorite um, polymer. So you can, you can get um, lactide, you can use an initiator to make polylactide, and then you can hydrolyze it to lactic acid, and then the lactic acid will go to CO2 and water, and then they will be taken up by your plants, which will make ferment, which you can then starch rich or sugar rich materials, which can ferment to make more lactic acid. And so you can make um, your monomer and you can go through this cycle. So PLA, which is this polymer here, is used in commodity plastics, um, lots of packaging at um, that's more of the higher end kind of packaging materials are, are made of PLA. This here is a PhD student, a former PhD student who, who's three or four years ago now, who did a bit of work in this area. And he was very excited with his PLA um, sutra that he had on his knee. This biocompatible is renewable and it's compostable, this material. OK, so it's, it's a very good um, plastic and it has a lot of, of benefits. And this, this was the first material that we sort of investigated in looking at in terms of chemical recycling. And I would be lying if I, if I said that we set, we set out to devise a catalyst that could chemically degrade um, PLA. We actually, if we're to be brutally honest, we, we stumbled across it um, in, in a workup process of, of, of when we made the, the polymer. So that, that's how we had got into this area maybe five or six years ago. It was, it was very serendipitous. We've spent a lot of time doing cat making catalysts for this polymerization, and, and we do have some of the fastest and the most selective catalysts out there in the literature. But I don't want to do I, I shan't dwell too much on, on the work that we're doing on, on um, the production of, of PLA. So the way, so as I alluded to, you can um, generate starch and, and sugars, and then you can 
ferment those and then you then do a polycondensation and then a back biting process to make your lactide which you then do a ring opening polymerization of to make your PLA which can then be used for cups and if you ever go to the Millennium Stadium in, in Cardiff all of their cups and etc will be made out of, of PLA. So this is this is a really um, promising alternative plastic to say PET and polyethylene in, in, in certain applications. It is under certain conditions, it is biodegradable as well. However, it could, could we do something clever with this and instead of allowing the polymer to degrade, can we actually chemically re recycle this plastic and keep the carbon in the higher value? Because if we go back to CO2, then we effectively we're losing a little bit of value in that material. So what we've spent a lot of time doing is, so this is it. So if we were to depolymerize it, we really should go back to lactic acid. And if we were to polymerize it, if we were to degrade it, sorry, we could in theory go to something like a lactic, a, a lactate ester, so R here, if that was methyl, this would be methyl lactate, for example, or ethyl, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are used in as, as solvents in various, in, in sort of niche chemical applications. So it's possible to go from the plastic and then through to a solvent. And you can do this, um, it, we should all remember our first year organic chemistry, we can activate we can activate our carbonyl if it coordinates to the metal center, and then we can activate that, and this can then be attacked by an alcohol. So what we could do is it's possible to then to degrade PLA back into a lactic ester. Now, what we can also do as well, it is possible now to take lactic esters and then convert those back into the cyclic ester. So this is some of the first, I, I also am a big believer um, I probably wasn't 10 years ago. I always used to think that if you could make a really complicated ligand in catalysis made in 10 steps or whatever, then this was always a, a good thing to do. But, but, but nowadays my, my mind has changed on this. What, you, what we want in this area is we want the ligand to be super, super simple. So all, all the ligands that I'll show are, are very, very simple shift bases. Um, I used to be okay, I, know, I was gonna say good then, but I, I used to be okay in, in the lab as a synthetic chemist when, um, when I did my PhD and, and before, but um, it has to be really, really simple chemistry that even, even an old duffer like me could still come into the lab and make so some of these ligands. So they're very, very simple, high yielding step where we take an aldehyde and an amine and make these shift bases. We then react them. We, we use diethyl zinc mainly because that's just so simple to use. Okay, we probably could make these catalysts just as well with um, zinc acetate. So what we make is the cat is the catalyst, and what we're trying to do is to change the groups on the aromatic ring and the groups at the end of the chain here. So it's typically typically R2 is, is a nitrogen containing species, or, or we've also looked at just the propyl material. And, and what we're interested in is trying to develop catalysts and looking at the kinetics of these for the degradation of, of PLA. And we spent quite a lot of time sort of working out how to do this. It's, it's not as easy as, as it, as it um, is, is written down in ChemDraw. And, and uh, we've got, um, internal methines and then you can sort of use proton NMR and work out um, how much of it has has degraded, how much is methyl lactate, how much is oligomers, and how much is the original polymer that, that you start off with. And, and, and that there's quite a few groups now sort of looking at this um, in in chemistry and, and in, in the area. And our catalysts are some of the fastest there are. So at, at, the, de at the degradation of, of PLA. I'll, I'll touch on mixed materials in, in a moment. What we've also done, we've developed um, kinetic models for this process and, and we can look at this and we can work out the process for this. And we believe it's just effectively chopping the polymer up as, as we go. 
So what we've done, what we're doing at Bath is developing a, a suite of catalysts, not only that can bring open um, lactite and make PLA, we can then do chemical recycling back into lactic esters, or we can convert these into higher value compounds. And then these can then be converted back into the monomer. And so we can have a, a virtuous circle. So we, we've, we've also, um, so we, we, we've looked at other kind of um, catalysts for this. So this is a, a second set of, of systems. And in this case here, we, we've changed it slightly. So we make our shift base, but then we actually reduce it. And, and the reason for why we, we do this is we think that there's an interaction between the NHs um, a hydrogen bonding interaction between the NHs and, and the carbonyl of the polyester, which actually is a beneficial um, in, interaction, which helps kind of stabilize the catalyst and, and gives us better activity. So this is, this is the rationale with, with why we looked at this. So we do have catalysts that are really, really active for the degradation of, of PLA. But I'll say so. So PLA is, is as I said, is, is a great, in my opinion, a really great plastic to be working working on, and it will only um, it will increase in its sort of volume in the market. It can, will only increase as we go forward. But at the moment, even the um, cheerleader of PLA, myself, it isn't sort of making a big impression at the moment, but it will as, as we go forward. So what we then thought was, well, can we use the catalysts that we're making and actually use these to degrade other polyesters? And so one of the materials that we wanted to look at is, is polycarbonates. So I was discussing this with some undergraduates um, last week who were doing their literature projects. And I was discussing this in terms of um, degrading compact discs. And they all looked at me a little bit blank and said, what's a compact disc? So that probably shows my age. And so it's not just compact discs that are made of polycarbonates. So there are a lot of construction materials that are polycarbonates, so conservatory trees and lots of in cars that they have a very high melting point so that um, <clears throat> so that they use ubiquitous and that there's a huge volume of, of polycarbonates and and the first and this here is one of the main polycarbonates that is used and what we wanted to try to do was to develop a series to see if our catalyst would work in for polycarbonate um, degradation so we've shown they work for PLA. So can we take the same catalysts and try them for other plastics? So this area is dominated by organo catalysts, which is so these are your classical organic organo catalysts for this work. They tend to need relatively high um, temperatures, loadings, and quite long um, reaction times as well. And they can be relatively expensive. But just to clarify, I've not worked out the cost of, of our catalyst, so I can't say that ours are, ours are definitely cheaper, but, but my back of the envelope calculation thinks they are. And so what we've done, or, or what Jack has done, is he spent a lot of time during his PhD taking, taking um, one, one of our zinc catalysts, and we found this one to be the best catalyst for this work. We, we spend a lot of time studying them via NMR and, and crystallography, and we, we find that this is five coordinate. So we optimize temperature so we can get very good conversions um, in, in short reaction times at 50 degrees. We also have to add, obviously, we have the, these are glorified that this is a methanolysis process which is the, which is catalyzed by by the zinc center so we make the bisphenol a and we can also make dimethyl carbonate out of this process but we do need to add alcohol into the process and we, we've looked at the amounts of this and we find that so we've optimized the amount of alcohol and then we've looked at optimizing the loadings of this as well so we can get away with about four weight percent of, of catalyst. So we've actually now managed to sort of, we, we started off with PLA, which is a, a up and coming biopolymer. And now we can also show that we can use the same catalyst and degrade polycarbonates. And this was one at the time, and, and we look at the kinetics of this. And so this is one of the fastest examples in the literature 
of, of catalysis of um, de degrading po polycarbonates. And so what we can also do is, is look at these for PET. So PET, uh, as Bruce um, so elo eloquently described, is, is a huge is a huge market. It's basically what all of Coca-Cola bottles are made of. And I should also have a little just to be BBC about this and have a Pepsi bottle there as well. So we can actually use our catalysts to degrade PET. It works incredibly well. The problem with problem when we do this is we have to heat this at quite high temperature. So I think we have to do this at about, about 150 degrees, but that is just to help um, solubilize the, the autumn to melt the material. And so we can get very high yields of, D, of DMT out of this, or if we do it with ethylene glycol, we can get very high yields of BHET, which is then the monomer for this process. But what we've also shown with PET is that we, so we, we're adding ethylene glycol for, um, as the alcohol, but we don't necessarily have to do that. We could, in theory, add amines into this or an amino alcohols, or we could add um, diamines into this process as well. So now you can envisage that what we're doing now is converting waste and spent PET into um, into other diamines, so we could potentially use these as building blocks for polyamides. Um, what we're also looking at is looking at mixed polymers. And the first example of a mixed polymer we've looked at is, is, our, is PLA and PET. And we, with PLA, we can degrade PLA at about 50 degrees with the methanolysis and so we can also use this chemical sort of recycling strategy as a way of you of re chemically recycling mixed feeds so the way we do it <clears throat> is we, we have a mixture of pla and pet and our catalysts initially will degrade pla and then we can remove or distill off um, the methyl lactate, and then we can either, we can add um, we can either increase the temperature and add um, ethylene glycol, and then we can then degrade um, the PET to make um, the, the, the monomer again. So it, 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 we have shown that we can actually use these processes for mixed feeds, and we, we, we've also looked at. Um, I think it's also important when we're looking at this, and this is an example with an organo catalyst. And again, this is with PET, where we were able to degrade the PET using our organo catalyst. And then what we were, so, so this is the DSC. It's very hard to work out the molecular weight of, of PET because it's very hard to dissolve it into anything. And so how people kind of look at this is looking at DSC. So we run the DSC of a PET bottle to get the melting point. And this is PET that we bought from Sigma to work out its uh, melting points. And then what we've done is we've then degraded um, the PET bottle. We've re-polymerized it, which is this blue trace here. And we can show that with, with our degradation catalyst, we can actually make PET with the same um, properties as, as you started off with. So we've shown that we can make a series of catalysts um, for degradations. I think mixed streams is going to be a problem with chemical catalysis, and then we will need to. There will be something that will need to be done in terms of cleaning the process. Um, we are, we're also able to degrade polycarbonates in this process. And what we're looking at at the moment is, is with another company, um, is, is a specific kind of, is looking at degrading of PPE um, with, with, with some of our catalysts. Uh, we're trying to sort of develop some larger scale processes for this. So the funding, I must just the University of Bath and the EPSRC, we were recently lucky enough to get a catalysis hub project in this as well. Um, Matthew Davidson, Paul McEwen and from the University of Bath, Jack Payne and Jack Stewart were two great PhD students in this project. I think it's really, really important in, in any area of catalysis to collaborate with, with others. So I, 
I, I'm a synthetic inorganic chemist by, by training. And, and I have been lucky enough to work with two really great chemical engineers, um, Joe Wood at the University of Birmingham. And, and fortunately, Daryl is no longer with us, but he was um, a, a great chemical engineer at, at the University of Bath. Um, and if anybody has any questions, just either ask in the chat or um, ping, ping me an email. Thank you.